Hey, 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 everybody. It is I, Hope Giselle, Hope Disguise, and I'm coming at you all today with a special episode of Can We Talk Podcast. Now, if you are listening to this over the airwaves, I am so sorry for you because there are like so many beautiful men on this screen right now and you are missing it. But I still want to encourage you if you're somebody who's on your way to work or on your way to the gym and you cannot watch this, continue to listen, but make sure you hit my YouTube and my Patreon to get a glimpse at what this conversation actually looks like. Because if you're like me, I'm a visual person. I need to see who is talking and, and, and be able to dissect things, okay? But today, I wanted to have a conversation with my brothers, and not just my Black brothers, but my gay Black brothers. As a Black trans woman, there are so many conversations swirling about the ways in which we interact with different people in our community, outside of our community, why there's a tit for tat sort of thing going on, and I wanted to be able to allow people to come and tell their own stories, as well as get some of their own issues off of their chest. As trans women, we have taken up a lot of space lately being able to tell everybody exactly what's going on with us but i'm guilty as a black trans woman of not really knowing what's happening to my brothers and how their world is affected by whatever right and so that's why i brought a couple of my friends to come and help to educate myself and to educate you all and if it needs to happen i might do a little education myself but i want you all to say hello to mr kendall edwards mr austin higgins mr monroe howard and mr philip Evelyn the second. Hey y'all. Hey, how are you? So I have to ask y'all the million dollar question, which is can we talk? Of course. Let's do it. <laughs> Austin is like, mm-hmm, yep. <laughs> so I think that first and foremost, I have to start off with with the the, the elephant in the room question because I want to be as quiet as I can be throughout the rest of this conversation. And I have to say that as a Black trans woman, sometimes not with any of you, but obviously I'm sure y'all know because y'all probably have friends who feel a certain type of way about trans women or don't understand or don't respect or go out of their way to disrespect, you know, trans women. And obviously you all are not proprietors of that narrative. But what do you all think that the big issue is there, especially when it comes to like Black gay men and Black trans women, why there's such like a distressing relationship there like why and feel free to just kind of jump in if you have an answer um oh, i'll go first i think that it's uh it is a a weird form of homophobia i think that the black community has decided that y'all are men in dresses um there is a complete uh miseducation willful miseducation of your reality and i think that um they find comfort in that. I think that a lot of black people aren't looking for equity or equality. A lot of them are looking for white privilege and it shows up in how they, you know, they, they show up in spaces where there are not just trans women, not just black trans women, but queer people in general. Um, it, it seems more like, it's not about don't do it to me, it's don't do it without me. And so I um, think that that's the issue. It has nothing to do with um, anything other than just willful miseducation of the realities of queer people. And because we're talking about black trans women, black trans women. Oh. I, 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 think it's, I think it's this piece well, from my perspective, like where hurt people are hurting people and where individuals like ourselves who have been marginalized and many of us who grew up as young black gay boys and who've been ridiculed and all this other kind of stuff, this is an opportunity, unfortunately, to pass along the stuff that has been, you know, uh, uh, given to us by the way of ridicule and hurt. And so I think it's unfortunate that because there might not be the healing and there might not be the uncovering and discovery of the trauma. And of course, leading to the healing of the trauma, there is this perpetuation of it. And so when you're looking to, well, who else um, is marginalized or who else can I basically subjugate? Um, and, and unfortunately, Black trans women for the world seem to be the world's punching bag. And we've known that in so many um, different instances and, and it is unfortunate. So individuals who are hurting themselves have now used that pain to inflict upon somebody else. And, I, and, and, and I've seen that in the communities in my experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hmm. Um, uh, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, but I just wanted to say, um, first and foremost, <laughs> I will say 
I am a little nervous. <laughs> I'm not too used to doing stuff like this. And <laughs> I followed a few of you um, for a while. And I don't know, I'm just not <laughs> usually the person speaking on things like this. Um, I have been doing quite a bit of ruminating on this topic myself, um, a, a bit outside of um, even race. I think it's an additional layer that's kind of just like added on to this entire thing. But I've been thinking a lot about gender um, and it's kind of supreme conflation in just in the world. Um, it even kind of hit me recently that uh, I don't know why I, I've just realized now that um, let's just say in the US that we really do or we really are unable to separate um, gender and sex. Uh, even thinking about the bathrooms and how there's like literally like men's or rather yeah, men's and women's bathrooms, you know. Um, so I've just been thinking a lot about that. And God, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I lost my point. If you need Can I point? interject? Take, yeah, take your time, brother. <laughs> mm. Okay. I think that queer people and trans people um, put a, a bit of a a bit of a wrench in uh, in the machine for a lot of people. I think a lot of people are so used to um, men having having dicks and women having pussies, and the moment um, the moment you display any kind of behavior outside of what is the normal for gender. Um, I believe that people begin to look internally. I mean, it's literally, um, it's, I think a lot of people view the world. Um, oh man, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I just think a lot, once you begin to alter the beliefs of other people, or once you begin to show people that there are more, or there's more to this life or in this world than what they believe, um, the world kind of begins to crumble around them. And I think rather than attempt to learn, a lot of people automatically lean into um, attack mode, into war. Um, and for people that are so far from the norm, I mean, just trans people in general, trans women in general, um, if you add on this whole layer of just blackness, you know, we are already constantly under attack. Um, I think black trans women are just so out of the norm for people that rather than take time to alter or change their own world to really think about these things, you know, people just lash out and yeah, harm other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I may, yeah. I think that um, I mean, we all we all have we all have some layer of I want to choose my words really carefully. We all have some layer of privilege, and as it pertains to trans people and specifically Black trans women in this time in this moment, there has been so many things that. I didn't know that I now know and make a conscious effort to just do better. And the rift that I witness and that I see, um, and mostly online because I don't really go out, I don't go nowhere. And you know, as far as pandemic is concerned, I'm just like really hunkered down here. But it bothers me so much specifically because, you know, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I also used to be a lot into um, the ballroom scene there and also coming up in, into New York. And seeing this really crazy tension between specifically Black gay men and our black trans sisters and brothers really bothers me because I, 
there's so much going on right now, especially with the with the trauma that Black trans women deal with all of the time. And, you know, I follow Hope and India and, and a lot of other trans people on Instagram and, and Facebook and, and things will come up and I'll be like, fuck, you know, something else, it's something else, it's always something else. And I consciously check myself and say, damn, I know I'm at the bottom, but there's someone else beneath me. And that right now in this moment, to me personally, are our black trans brothers and sisters. And what I don't understand with specifically with black gay men at this time is why we don't seem or why they don't seem to have the degree of empathy that we seek or have sought in our own upbringing, you know, as, as far as being kids and, and being outcasts for being, you know, the black sheep of the family, so to speak, you know, from my personal experience. So, you know, seeing the, the arguments and the, and, the, and the risks back and forth, it really just, it makes me really sad. Imagine me being an empath in 2020. It makes <laughs> me really sad because it's just, it's so much and I can only understand. I mean, I can't even understand because of course I'm not a trans person, but to be a part of a community with a, a large group of people that you think has your back and then you see and hear things that continuously keep you down is a problem. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my opening. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say on that. But so yeah, I think that I'll I'll come back to what we can see as solution based, you know, sort of narratives around that a little bit later. But I want to jump into what you all think your biggest uh, plight is right now as men who are black and and gay. Like how how is the world treating you right now? And especially during times of COVID where everybody is on, you know, some sort of screen, you can't really blend in with the rest of the staff anymore. So if you are a more, um, I guess, visibly gay, because that, I don't know, like we know what that means, but also like there's sort of like this toxicity around what that really means. Right. Um, and so it's one of those things where it's just like, now that we're in this world where it is very much so like this, everybody's looking at the camera, people are kind of sort of veering off from the speaker and looking around at the rest of their coworkers now, or um, now you're just kind of forced to have these very intimate conversations, even though they're so far away. Um, and there's all this nuance about you that's now like exposed, right, for the world to see. And then there's all of these really deep dived conversations into the world of, of, you know, LGBT people because people have nothing else better to do when they're obsessed with us, right? And so as, as Black gay men, like what, what does the world feel like right now for you? Is it heavy? Like, how do you feel? You know, and I was thinking about this. Um, it depends on, for me, it depends on who, what audience are we talking about? Are we talking about within the Black community? Or are mm. we talking about outside of the black community because here's what i'll say about outside of the black community for me my gayness actually gives me that it actually disarms uh my blackness for True. a lot of people um and it is something that i have yes. definitely struggled with because as a black man i don't necessarily walk in the room and you can necessarily if you want to talk about the you know clockable you know and things that we're talking about um you know and, and and if i would be considered masculine presenting i don't all the time you would know okay that man is gay until you talk to me or until whatever see you see me hold my boyfriend's hand or i may be affectionate whatever the case may be so my blackness will always go before me um in many of these instances and what i found in my experience is that these white folks have the moment that there is an inference that i'm gay there's a moment that i explicitly state i'm gay when i use a certain pronoun for a partner then there is almost this is like oh okay <laughs> yeah. there's, there's that, that happens with them that now I am more acceptable. It's the same thing um, when it comes to, you know, um, oh, oh, so you you went to 
graduate school or you went like all of these like entrances into their acceptability standards. So I say mm -hmm. that, right? Um, which is which is bothersome to me because I'm like, um, if I wasn't gay, if I hadn't gone to college on any level or whatever, I am still worthy of being here, period, in this space and whatever the case may be. So I'll say that. The other thing is, is as far as the black community, if we're having that conversation, my personal experience has been, you know, it still is, you know, you are the, the outcast that we talked about. Um, I think, and especially, and then depending on how you present, um, I, I was talking, I was on another panel with uh, a, another group of brothers um, where someone who is um, may, uh, maybe more feminine presenting versus someone who's masculine presenting, there is always this level of like, well, this is what gay looks like. And people have decided in certain spaces, whether it be the black church or whether it be, you know, uh, black fraternal organizations or whether it be, you know, in other black social circles, the black family or whatever the case may be, people have said what is acceptable uh, of your presenting of your sexual orientation. And if they are not comfortable, if it's deemed not comfortable, again, in these black subsets uh, uh, of, of the black community and the subsets of the black community, then you will be outcast. So if you're a masculine presenting man and people assume you might be straight and then you are gay, then now people feel deceived. Um, now people feel like you weren't honest or you weren't true. Um, if you are in spaces in the black barbershop, for example, and you are a more feminine presenting man who is confident about who you are, then you are othered automatically and you are ridiculed, you are whispered about, you are, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of different things that go. So, so again, I, I answer that question where it just depends on the audience, black or not black, um, and then it also depends on the context as far as like geographic or location, like where so I'm at. What I want to interject really quickly is that you said something that for me was kind of triggering because I know that there's going to be somebody that's going to listen to this and be like, so because I'm masculine, I'm not comfortable. Like I'm not confident being gay. Yeah, and no. I think that there needs to be an explanation around yeah. that confidence, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, and what I was saying is, is basically, and not to say that a masculine presenting man is not comfortable or confident being gay, what my point was in saying that a, 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 a man who is maybe more feminine presenting, who is comfortable and confident in who they are in certain environments, um, becomes a threat um, for some reason to these other individuals who may be heterosexual or who they themselves may be struggling with their own identities. And so your assuredness or your self-love um, becomes a threat. So absolutely not. And thank you for, for that clarification. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to say that uh, within or without my issue with the Black community, I feel like change starts at home. Um, you can't expect someone else to respect you when your own family does not, when the people that look like you do not. Um, I think that we have got to get to a point to where we're having these conversations about, you know, the intersections of blackness. I have a real issue right now with whether or not, I'm in Maryland, and I'm um, having a real issue deciding if I'm going to that march or not, because I don't believe it's for me. I don't believe that it's for my sisters who identify as queer. I don't think that it's for us black, you know, the black trans community. I don't think that it's for us. And I am no longer comfortable being uncomfortable so that cisgender, straight, black people can feel comfortable. And I've been having a, a really hard time with that because I hate when people say like, you're black first. Let me tell you something, whether you can see it or not, I'm black and gay. It doesn't matter what you see first. Both of them are relevant. Both of them have importance and I you know me personally I present myself I'm all like I have on a fitted shirt I have on fitted pants I wear short shorts I want you to know straight up <laughs> from the get-go whenever you see oh he gay yep <laughs> because it's important you know we're living in a time where it's a political statement to live in your truth it's a political statement to say I'm gay and I'm black and I'm proud. I am trans. I really, honestly, in my opinion, I really, with my understanding of the trans narrative, they're straight women. 
women trying to date straight men and they're supposed to be able to. So me personally, I have a hard time sometimes wrapping my mind around that because I don't want straight people around us. Like I don't want them ruining our stuff. And I know that our sisters date them. So they have to come over here at some point. You know, there has to be a conversation. Um, I'm, I've really been struggling with that because I'm the type of person where if you look on my page, I'm just like, fuck them, part of my language. It's just like, if I do show up for that march, where's the gay section? Because we're going to present everybody. We're going to present Tony McDay. We're going to present Breonna Taylor. We're going to speak up for George Floyd. We're going to have everybody's name. If y'all want to be over there and just talk about the straight people, then do that over there. But you're not going to come and knock on our chamber door. Y'all got us in the closet or in the, um, or in the dungeon like, it's time to march. Like, what do you mean? It's time to march. And I've kind of gotten, I don't want to say I've gotten in trouble, but a lot of black people, are they, we all black never means we all black until someone who you think the assumption is that George Floyd is a straight man. The assumption is that Breonna Taylor was a straight woman. And that's why you're okay with it. And I, that's why, I guess to get back to the meat of it, that's my biggest flight. My biggest flight is our community. We cannot expect irrational racist white people to think of us as important, to think of us as equal human beings when we don't even treat each other like equal human beings. They're like, you can't say black on black crime. You don't think that an irrational person who believes that they're better than us because of the color of their skin, you don't think that they, they will also have the irrational thought that black on black crime gives them the leeway to kill us too? I don't know what's going on here. There, 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 is, a dis, there is a willful disconnect when it comes to black people and black queer people. And when people try to make the excuse like, oh, the buck breaking, let me tell you something. The inheritance of trauma is no longer an excuse. None of y'all was on any of those slave ships. None of y'all were buck broken. So all this anger and all this animosity and all this willful ignorance about queer people, that's not an excuse any longer for me. It's no longer an excuse to hate us, to kill us, to burn us, and to get away with it. So that's my, I'm sorry, I got a little heavy, but that's my, <laughs> that's my, that's my, that's my plight. That's my biggest plight as a black gay man, as a black same gender loving man. Kendall, can I, I, just, I just want to ask one quick question because I heard something in there where, um, yes. you know, I just, I just wanted to interject also that like, however you choose to present, because I heard you talking about like the way in which you choose to dress, to present, you want someone to know your truth in, in before you, you know, say it or whatever the case may be. But I just also want to say that you can walk in your truth. You can, you can live in your truth. You can embrace your truth and, mm -hmm. and still choose to express yourself in a way that may not be because of the world's standards of what gay looks like. Oh, no, may, no, no, not no. Be, may not be right away something that somebody would would uh, would would say, oh, that that man is gay. So I just I just want to say that because there's there's a lot of people who I know that each and every day are proud gay men mm -hmm. who walk in their truth, who live their truth, who may not wear short shorts, and that's okay. And the the men oh, who definitely. do wear short shorts, like that's okay. I just want it to be okay for living in your truth and presenting however you want to present. Period. No, 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 no. What I what I what I mean by that when I say that that just so happens to be how I already like to dress. Yeah. What I'm saying is because I do believe that my sexuality is a political statement, I do, I make an intention to go an extra mile. Not saying that that's what, how anybody has to present. I'm saying that there's a little black boy who may be built a bay masculine like me who feels that he can't wear a crop top or he feels like he can't wear short shorts and I'm like oh no 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 you do what you want that's the that's the best part about being gay you can do whatever you want at this point nobody can tell you anything once you're out here in the open living in your truth that's the ultimate freedom so what I'm saying to me what I'm saying is if you look on my page you see nothing but black gay men because there is a little boy out there who needs to see himself and I like that. To any of our pages. I, I bring that up because I feel like I understand. Yeah, there, there is also and I've been a part of that where 
maybe someone who presents in a certain way looks at another person who doesn't present that way and and will make that statement that mm. you aren't proud of who you are or you're not owning who you are and mm. and I, I just don't think that that should be imposed upon anybody about because we all have our own journey on how on who we are you know yeah and, um, so yeah but thank you no i, I appreciate that um I'll go next um personally my plight i feel may be a bit different um because of where i live um i now live in los angeles i used to live in baltimore um <laughs> so very different climate in regards to uh homosexuality all that stuff like that like really it's very very different um so my sexuality I, I feel ever since i've been out here hasn't really been much of a thing um but because LA has this image of like uh, hyper liberalism, you know, um, what I have found has changed um, since the beginning of 2020, since the protests, has actually been um, more so my blackness and how it's perceived. And it's a bit of an inverse, it's an inverse of the aggression, or that's what it seems like at least. Um, I think it's still very aggressive. It's, it's not people, um, it's not people attacking me <laughs> um, or othering me. That's, well, no, that's not true. It's not people attacking me because I'm black. It's more so people walking on eggshells to an extreme degree because I'm black. Um, so with this whole Corona thing happening, I have had to get a job at a goddamn house, you know, um, <laughs> and I meet a lot of people every day. And I have a lot of elderly white people. I'm in Glendale, this is Little Armenia. I'm surrounded by white people. I have many older white people coming up to me saying like, you know, I just, I just think what they did to that man was so awful. I'm like checking out someone else's bags. I'm like, Miss Ma'am, I don't know. I don't even too much know who you are. I don't know why you're walking up to me like this. Like, <laughs> like you were on your way out. You had your groceries already. You stopped. You stopped what you were doing. Saw my hair, came over to me and tried to, you know, profess your white guilt to win some points for yourself. I'm like, please spare me. Spare me because I don't want it. And it's not going to help you. I just had so much of that. Um, or I've had misguided, you know, white people come up to me in an attempt to, to um, uplift me, I think. Um, literally just today, just today, I was um, getting carts for the grocery store. And this man walks up to me and he goes, you look like, you look like you've been scared. I'm like, <laughs> like... I look as if I've been shot to the point that my hair has just blown. And I'm just like, I, I, <laughs> and he said afterwards, it looks good. But I, I just, it took everything in me. <laughs> it took everything in me to not almost attack the man. Because <laughs> to him, to him, I'm sure that was a compliment. I'm sure that was, they said, that hair is cool. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, I, I get a lot of pandering. Um, I think less people are, are scared of me in particular because of my, my physical expression, because of my, my hair, my demeanor. Um, I, I very much so give flower child, I think, to people. And I think a lot of people um, surprisingly enough, don't identify me as as queer. Usually, off the bat, unless I, if I tell someone, they are usually surprised, which I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I um, the only thing that's changed for me has been how people perceive my blackness and how people approach my blackness. Um, I think because of where I live, my queerness hasn't really changed too much. Um, except for, you know, when I tell people, of course, they're going to go ahead and be like, yes, queen, like all that, like, I don't, this isn't drag race, get out of my face. Yeah, <laughs> that's that on that. <laughs>
Um, I know for me, um, uh, I mean, I've been black for 30 plus years. So um, I have felt the weight of a lot of things as of, as of late. Um, but I think that's normal with all of the things that have transpired and that are going on. Um, as the gentleman said, um, uh, sorry, Kendall said earlier about having to navigate um, the intersection of blackness and gayness. Um, you know, speaking to that, as far as me getting up and going to a protest, whether it be, you know, Black Lives Matter, Black Trans Women Matter, like the whole thing. For me, it's, I agree with what you were saying, Kendall, in that they both matter. Um, and there is this um, argument from a lot of cis, straight, Black people that, oh, you know, you're Black first. And I do agree with that because that's what you see when you see me, you see a black man. Without me opening my mouth, I'm standing across the street, you see a black man. I am a proud same gender loving man, but black is surely the immediate. And what I can't stand is when there are trying to make this argument oh you're black first as in like we got to take care of this first and then we'll get to y'all mm. and they never get to us mm. and that's what i don't mm. like because it's almost as if yeah 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 you know we'll talk about our unity later but right now we got to do this no mm. motherfucker excuse my language <laughs> this needs to happen at the same time that this is happening over here because as kendall said my blackness and my gayness or same gender loving uh as the same gender loving person matter period and that is an intersection that we don't have to disconnect we don't have to separate those two and so you know for me I mean, I feel really weird saying not much has changed because, you know, as far as my online platform, I've always been vocal about things and I've always been speaking out about certain um, specific issues. I mean, Hope, we, we have had many chats and many conversations. So all of this is not new to me as far as like me feeling any different or, or navigating a, a certain path. Um, you know, I will say, though, uh, as the gentleman was talking about earlier, that pe people are all, all kind of like on eggshells around me. I don't necessarily get that, but I, I'm getting a lot of like, you know, messages from white friends or text messages like, hey, I read this. What do you think about this and this and this and this? And I'm like, don't send me this shit. Go and do it is a privilege for you to actually do research about racism um and homophobia and transphobia and not experience it that is a privilege so it's like don't come over here with that you know if you want to have a genuine conversation i may have the time for you but at this point please use your googles because i'm not it um you know so so that's how i feel at the at the moment but um you know i i've just as a as a black gay man it's been I mean it's always been kind of tough um but I'm always looking at the people who and within our community I'm talking about black LGBTQ I'm always looking at the people who don't look like me who aren't who don't present like I present I know what people see when they look at me if I don't open my mouth I'm over six three and like 200, about 225, 230 pounds. I already know what I'm giving. I'm worried about the people that don't get that within our community. Um, and, you know, I guess you could say I kind of have this 
um, and not comparing myself to a black trans woman, but it's so interesting how we treat black trans women who are say passing and beautiful compared to those who are not where within our community i think we can kind of hold the same uh level to same gender loving men that you know someone who is like tall and masculine presenting and muscular has this certain privilege and nobody really nobody really wants cares to like dissect or see what's going on with with them because like they're good visually i'm not i'm not put off by that so i'm okay you know i i know what that cloak can do i know the privilege that 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 brings um so yeah <laughs> kind of lost my thought a little bit but <laughs> i forgot i was going somewhere in there <laughs> so there's a and i'm, I'm actually because it, it segued into the point that i wanted to bring Austin back around on uh, because you said something that I find to be really interesting and I think that most people or most femme affirming people or as Monroe was saying people who are supposed to be femme affirming right um, to help perpetuate this narrative about the way that we're supposed to be if we are or if we identify a certain way um, that that whole string of like the second that people find out you know that you are queer it's like mm. if they are an ally it becomes this thing where it's like yes queen girl yeah. get slay <laughs> and it's just like where does that even come from because it's two seconds much. ago and I find it to be extra because I like Phil you're smiling and I'm glad that you are because that means or I can assume that that means that you've gone through that but to me it's really funny because it doesn't matter what your stature what your outside appearance mm -hmm. is because Phil is yeah. a very tall very and like he said if he does not open his mouth I took him with me as my security to um, yes. <laughs> um but We'll get into that a little bit later because I think that that's Not something that Phil taught me that I think that a lot of gay men need to learn. But um, I told I took Phil with me as my security to go to this thing that I was kind of uneasy about because a straight black man was going to be in the room and there were nothing else but women in the room with us. And mm -hmm. so if things went right, I wanted a man to be with me. But in the interview, the guy physically said, like, Hope got her security over there in the corner. Da, 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 he was like, <laughs> yeah, right. He was like, There's your bodyguard, you know? And it was just funny to me because after the after everything was over over and Phil kind of sort of started to speak, then there was like this laid back sort of like mm -hmm. intonation. And mm -hmm. from the female co-host after everything was over, I never told you this, Phil, but she was like, oh, girl, you're like, I didn't know he was one of us. Like, and I was just like, but he's not, though. He's still a man, you know? And so it's just really interesting. Like, how do you all navigate that? Like when the yes girl sort of kind of comes into the space? It's funny that entire topic, like with me, I had to kind of do a lot of unpacking on that one um you know when people well it's specifically with white lgbtq people whenever mm -hmm. it's like they get real comfortable real quick and i have to check mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. because it's giving you know you know yes queen or yes sis and i'm just like you don't know me like that and years ago like it, it doesn't necessarily bother me so much um anymore de depending on who it is but i kind of had to internally ask myself why does certain why why do certain labels bother me why is it a thing why can't you know you call a group of girls guys and you know what i'm saying like i had to do a lot of thinking like what what is it really is it is it me do i have some like childhood trauma to unpack here like what is going on and um you know i it's definitely just a comfort thing for me i, I don't think there's any crazy thesis that needs to be behind it but i will say that specifically with a lot of white people in the lgbtq community they want to be so down, so to speak, mm -hmm. 
that it's so quick for them to be like, yes, there's a blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I didn't see you. I've never seen you at a ball. I Like, when did all of this happen? When did all of this come up? And so for me, it's like really checking those outside of our safe circles. Um, and it doesn't necessarily bother me so much from within. Um, but I, I think it's, I, I think it all depends. Again, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I'm just speaking from personal experience, but you know, that's I, me. I think Phillip, I had to unpack like you did. Uh, well, I'm, I won't say that it was the same experience, but I had to unpack my own shit because when someone would do that, I reverted or I regressed all the way back to my childhood when I was called faggot. Um, I regressed all the way back to my childhood when, you know, again, there was punk was used, um, you know, all these kind of things and the things that I associated with any of the pronouns that were, um, you know, feminine, um, specific, cis, you know, child, girl. I remember as a kid, it, it would trigger me so badly if I was having a conversation kid even into like um adolescence and early adulthood and I would have a conversation with a woman and we would just be going back and forth and we're having a conversation and she would slip up and be like girl oh I'm sorry I'm sorry and I remember how right. traumatizing and triggering that was for me especially because and I've talked about this before as a child, the first time I was called gay, faggot, sissy, all this other kind of stuff, I learned how to perform. I learned how to perform masculinity. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, obviously I can't do this. I can't sit like this. I can't say this. And, and there just became this automatic performance. So then it was super traumatizing when I felt like I had learned this performance and I'm like, damn, what the fuck did they see? Like, why did she, why did she say, why does she slip up and say, girl, like, why? Right, and, right. and so I carried that. I carried that. So I remember having conversations with my other gay brothers. And if they would in this circle be like, bitch, like, da, 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 or using stuff like that. And I remember I'd be like, yo, don't, don't, don't call me that because of my trauma mm. around that. I'd be like, yo, yes. I'm, I'm your boy. I'm whatever, but I'm not your girl. I'm not your sis. I'm not bitch. I'm not that. And it really took time for me to really recognize and unpack and heal from that trauma of what I associated, you know, those pronouns with, uh, um, with, with, with thing, like it was the thing to avoid. Like, I did not want to be that. I thought that that was the antithesis of what it meant to be okay. Like all these things that I had developed as a result of the trauma that I personally endured. And when I unpacked that, and when I just, for my own journey and for myself, became comfortable with who, you know, like I had to become comfortable with Monroe, all of, when I, when I was able to stop feeling like I had to perform and I could just be, then I wasn't as triggered. And, I, and I've seen the evolution of like, if somebody, yeah. you know, like even today, I, I sometimes I still see somebody be like, bitch, and I'd be like, bitch, shut up. You know, I mean, it's Ooh. now just like, <laughs> Oh shit, you're doing it. You know what I'm saying? But I I had to <laughs> No, I had to deal with some shit. I had to deal with some shit. So yeah. Um I mean oh sure. Um <laughs> Um I I have trouble with it. I'm I'm not gonna lie. Um specifically from um white queer people um and that's not even like the, the worst of of all of it um because i when white pe white queer people you know refer to me as like like sis you the whole like yes like it it sets off <laughs> it sets off this alarm in my head because all i can think of all i can think of is appropriation it's just mm -hmm. all i can think of it's, it's constantly like I just wonder, it's like, do you even like know what a ball is? Like, do, like, just the entirety of what drag has become at this point and how it is now so centralized around whiteness and its origins have been forgotten. And when I just see 
all these people just taking this language. Um, it's one thing in just the queer community, but it's another thing entirely when I have these straight white women figuring out that I am queer and like all of a sudden, oh, you're gonna be my best friend, you can be my new best friend. And like, yes, honey, yes, sis, and all this shit like that. I'm just like, girl, you don't even know, like, you don't know about my plight, you don't know about my people, you don't know about where those words have even come from. Um, I'm not even sure if you too much watch a lot of drag race. Like, it's just, I get really uncomfortable with it and, um, I'm in this space right now where I'm, I'm learning to accept the fact that not everything is appropriation. I can't attack every white person that speaks like a black person I, because some people yeah. genuinely have, they, they've grown up, up in areas like this. It's just a thing that's happened and we cannot sit here and pretend that a lot of language and like the patterns of language it's just it's literally just based off of your environment um but when i see people add on this mask they, they just they see something in a person and everything was fine until they hear this one thing and then it's like oh i have my in i have my my entryway now i can say these things and it's fine because i have a gay friend and it's like no like this that is not to me it's still not okay um, it's really not okay. <laughs> so, um, I'm trying to be as tolerable as possible. Um, I'm surprisingly okay with, you know, just like black queer people saying this stuff to me. I do have a thing with the word cis. I do. And I think more so because for me, tonally, Maybe it's because of all the memes. Maybe it's because of everything I've watched. The word cis for me has always been um, kind of synonymous with, with attack. <laughs> um, I feel like a lot of people call people cis when something, they, they're doing something stupid or you, I, I, you, I know you don't know what I'm talking about, but yeah, like I, so the word cis still gets me. Um, but much like you, Monroe, I mean, I have been attacked for a lot of my life um, for my sexuality. Um, from people, yes, of course, you know, my thing, I wasn't really called faggot. I was just consistently called feminine. Um, and that was made uh, to mock, like to be a name to mock me. Um, so I grew up um, being terrified of walking because, you know, my, my grandparents, my family would come together and say like, you can't, if you walk like that in the streets, you will you will be beat up like you will be beat up this is baltimore you can't walk like that that's too many female artists in your repertoire is that beyonce again no you can't do that like that has been so internalized and i am in the in the past few years i'm, I'm now breaking you know free of all the stigma you know but um yeah i i for some reason have been pretty okay with the ass the asses and all the queen and shit like that, that stuff like that. But yeah, the moment it hits whiteness, there is a bit of a uh, like, ooh. <laughs> and the moment it hits straight whiteness, I mm. do feel offended. I feel completely, I don't think it's it, like, at least do research, girl. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> um, For me, it was a privilege. Like, I was, um, Really, really happy when I got to get in college and be as gay as I wanted to. Um, I was a, I was very shielded. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm one of eleven children, one daughter, and ten boys, and four wow. of us are gay. <laughs> so my brother, my wow. older my older brother, he took all of the. He's gay and he's a drag queen. So it was just like oh, he, got, yes. he took all of that. And for the uh, for a long time, I was the youngest, and so I I was very male presenting. And I was very shielded because I was I was whitewashed. Um, I lived with uh, some white people for a long time before I actually went with my forever family, and it was like it kind of gave me a competitive edge, which is weird. If you uh, if you read my blog called the Fucking Bitch Club, I talk about that, where it's like I was able to kind of slide through life in a in a very privileged way. So when it kind when I finally got to college and I was able to be gay. I was just like, I couldn't wait to be a mean girl. 
I couldn't wait to, you know, be Sharpay and be Regina George. And I was just like, girl, sis, bitch, yeah, uh-huh. And the gays that I was hanging around, we were all and um we were all very heteronormative. So you had the ones of us that were bottom, we were the girls, and the ones that were all the top, they were the boys, and I was just like, Oh, I'm loving this. Uh <laughs> so I was always very, very I was really excited about the prospects of being able to be in this space of you know, it's kind of like going to high school all over again. You get to do it over. You get to be who you exactly. wish you, you could have been when you were in high school. And so um, <laughs> for me, other black gay men, we can do it. We can chop it up. We can talk. We can key, key, all that. Black trans women, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for me, if it's, I remember uh, Philip was saying, like, it kind of feels like a propagation. It kind of feels like you're doing a little too much with it when, when uh, Caucasians they do it and they kind of overextend it and it's like and now you've ruined it you remember when that did the whole beans greens potatoes tomatoes and then that white woman oh, did it and it was dead it was just done <laughs> it's like that it's, it's just over. like nobody is like oh no 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 this isn't for you and honestly even when sh straight black women try to get in on it it's like i don't have a problem with it because i feel like our language is a remix of their language but it's like, right. once we've come up and make it new and make it popular, you can't come in and tell us what we can say or cannot say. You know, um, what was that, what's that quote? Um, what's the tea? That came from Braxton, I heard. You know, one of the Braxton sisters came up with, oh, what's the tea? Or she made it popular and all the gays started saying it after her. I'm not sure. But I do feel like a lot of our language is a, an over-exaggeration of cisgender female language. We have modified it, kind of made it a little bit more popular, and now it's our own individual language. So when I see you know, when I, a lot of girls be like, I don't like when y'all say fish, well, it's not for you. We say that around each other. Y'all want to be around us. Y'all want to be up under our, well, our situation. So, you know, and it's a term of endearment. If anybody that should have a problem with it, it should be black trans women who should be able to say, don't say that, because we'd be first one like, Oh, you see her? Is she a real girl? Oh, that's real fish. Oh, that's fish. Or, oh, no, she trans. She's not real fish. You know what I'm saying? So it's like the person that has an issue with it is the wrong person, in my opinion. Like, when, uh, when um, because it's supposed to be like a term of endearment. You know, men say it all the time, like, oh, that coochie's so good, that pussy's so good, all oh, that, this, this, that, the third. And it's just like, bro, when we say it, it's an issue. I just, so my, to answer the question, I, I love the language. I don't mind who uses it unless you're like, not like this. I'm, a little, I'm like, <laughs> like, don't do it. And if you try to police the language, then it's like, oh, no, I'm not here for that. But if, you, if, you, if you're black, you can. I'm out for you. It's, so, it's, it's kind of amazing to me how situational it is, though, because each of us has had different experiences growing up, and that has a Affected how we feel about mm -hmm. the usage of certain words. Yeah. Like the gentleman who spoke first said, you know, he always sees cis was kind of like um, uh, um, more like a more of a negative connotation. For me, it, it wasn't. But when I was bullied as a kid, faggot was the word that like, even me saying it, I still, I, I don't even like how it tastes on my mouth. And I, to me, it's like, it's worse than a curse word to me. And it's very triggering. So for me, you know, when Monroe was speaking about, you know, um, being called a faggot and a sissy and all of these things and, and having to put on a certain performance, I know what that feels like. And so there are certain words for me that I'm, I, I, I did have to unpack the, the girls and the certain people to be like, bitch, whatever, da, da, da. like I really had to do some internal work. And, but it's just amazing to me how each of us gave an almost completely different response because of our upbringing. So I really think um, the, the language is very kind of situational. Um, but again, I feel like it's also very communal because I feel like anybody that don't have this tone right here, it is giving eggshells for you. That's just what it is for me. <laughs> so I want to give uh, Jason, who joined us um, right before this question was asked, an opportunity to answer the question, which was um, based on 
a multitude of different things when people find out that you're a gay man if it's not like something that's written all over you right um they have the tendency to then change the way that they want to communicate with you so then it becomes it goes from like oh yeah jason like da, 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 to like yes bitch like oh my god like even with white people like it's just like oh my god queen slay like you're so amazing Ooh. right and so like how <laughs> how does that make you feel or what have been what's been your experience with like that if you've ever had that experience um sometimes it's sometimes it's 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 relieving because sometimes myself in the past, when I walked into a room, I thought I had to be straight or had to be, you know, <clears throat> don't show it. And then, you know, once somebody asks, I, t I tell anybody, if you ask me, yes, I'm gay. I'm not hiding me. I'm not changing me anymore. Like I'm not fighting who I am just to make you comfortable. I don't care. So if you say, hey, Jason, are you gay? Yes, I am. Then they're like, oh my God, me too. And I'm like, well, shit, thank God. Go. Like, we got something. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was putting up a front, you know. Um, I've always told myself that recently. I've been telling myself, you have to be yourself and stop trying to make everybody comfortable now just because you're gay. Like, I have more heterosexual guys that appreciate me being gay because I'm up front with it. Like, this is what it is. I'm not here to please you. I'm not here to change you. And like, what's up, bro? It was good. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's not going to happen in my world. So sometimes it can be relieving. And then, you know, um, I find it joyful that some people accept it. Like when the white people are excited about it, because majority of the time, our people are the main ones like, oh, bro, are you gay? Like, oh, sh wait a minute. We can't talk. Like, I remember in high school, there was this guy that I was really cool with. He didn't know that I was gay or I wasn't quote unquote out. But when he found out, um, he said, hey, we can't be cool anymore because, you know, you're gay and that's going to ruin my reputation in high school. And I said, wow, in high school. I said, you know, high school is only three years, babe. And after that, that's the real world. So if you're trying to just keep your reputation up in high school, we definitely can't be friends because my mind is bigger than that. Oh. And he did me a favor. So sometimes it's our own people that cause me to be like, yeah, I'm good. But when they accept, sometimes it's like so, uh, it's so accepting. It feels love. Like, damn, they don't even give a crap. They still want to be friends. Yes, they're interested in it. Yes, they want to know what the balls are. They've heard about it. They watch Pose. And um, I don't mind educating people. Like, I don't. You know, I want you to accept us because we're here. We've been here. So I'm fine with that because it can be fun to be free. I think that's what being gay is all about. Being yourself, loving life, having fun, and not worrying about somebody else's judgment. So, yeah, for me, it's fun. I, I like it. But don't call me no sir. Hey, sis. Hey, sis. <laughs> you not duty. You're not doing it. Hey, 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 hey. Calm it down. What you doing? What you doing? What you doing? So what I, what I have to do, I have to throw the monkey wrench in there because I think that as queer people and especially me being trans and having lived most of my life as a gay Black man, sorry y'all. There's like a little white girl running around and I don't trust the hoes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but... <laughs> There's a lot of like, I love myself, I appreciate myself, da 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 da, going on here. And then, especially what you just said and how you ended it off, Jason, I think that that's beautiful. But now I have to jump into the conversation that everybody is like. And more recently, I think I've seen Black women be like, okay, I hear that. But why you out here fucking these boys on the low if you feel all of these things about yourself? Like, if you feel like this is so great and so awesome and so blah, 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 then why is there this necessity, right, that there seems to be? Um, especially in the Black community. And I know, like, some people are like, well, hope you give the queen, the white queens do it too, but not as much. You will see two white queens who appear to be super feminine together out loud before you see a bunch of them, like, kind of like creeping and sneaking as a part of culture. But mm -hmm. when we're talking about DL culture, I see a lot of black trans women and a lot of gay black men who are not only a part of the culture, but 
seek it out, prefer it, and then idolize it and lift it up. Like being on Twitter, I have seen some shit that has made me cringe <laughs> from my black gay brothers around the topic. Like I don't care about the porn. Like I'm gonna watch the porn too. But when I see like when when I see certain conversations that are happening in the midst of the porn on on, on freak Twitters and stuff like that, and I'm watching like a lot of these DL men will put out posts that will be like, the reason I'm DL is because I can't I don't really like dudes. Like I just like fucking y'all. Blah 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 blah. And then there's a threat of other men that are like yeah bro like and I'm just like and then you have like all these gay guys who are openly gay usually feminine that are underneath those comments like I mean but these are the type of dudes I like like I like a nigga like that I could fuck with you hit me up where you be at and I'm just like we all fall short of the glory of God. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, so what? What? Wow. Uh, like, what do you all think that that's about? Like, outside of the masculinity complex, which I'm sure we'll we'll get into in the midst of this conversation, what do you all think that that is truly about? Is you know where we can we can uplift ourselves in such a way where we can be like Kendall and say like I'm deliberate about my expression because I love who I am, or we can be like Jason and be like I love being a gay black man, just respect my boundaries, or we can be like Monroe and be like I've had to come this far, but I also understand this part of myself you know and how to maneuver it in conversation or philip who is just like i understand the ways in which my gayness shows up or you know um or austin who is just like "Mm, i've had to be just be comfortable with who i am before i can check other people on the way that they address me right and so if we can come to all of these terms to love ourselves and, and and be in spaces where it's just like as Gay black men, I have come to this conclusion that I am worthy, that I am blah, 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 blah. I shouldn't have to hide. Why make it your business to fuck niggas that do? It's internalized racism. I mean, not internalized racism, it's internalized homophobia. And it's also, you know, we, no one wants to be alone. Um, Me personally, I am very heteronormative in my relationship because that works for me. I don't have to work for everybody that works for me. But as far as going out of my way to uplift a DL lifestyle because it it looks nice, that's not me. I think a lot of people, you know, it's just almost like gays in the black church. I don't know why we feel like we need to be there. But it's a thing of acceptance. People want to be in the community in which they were born into. You know, we, we love black people. I tell my straight black friends all the time, like, Y'all know y'all black. We know that. Y'all don't know that. You know, we, <laughs> like, we want to be here. Well, you know, I, I wanna, what I wanted to say earlier and it kind of segues into this is, it's not us two. It's us. You call for all the black people who've been murdered by the police. That's it. Tony McDade is a black person. Leilene Polanco is a black person. That's it. These are black people. It's not us too. Nobody's saying us too. We're saying us. So uh, to bring that back here, it's just like in, in this very toxic way, a lot of it is just, you know, people want to have sex with handsome people, but it's mostly just wanting to be in the number. You know what I'm saying? That's just like a song. I can't, you know, be in the number when they're, when they're trying to go to glory. It's like that. It's like people want to be accepted by the community. And a lot of black gay men feel as if trying to be like, I'm going through a sexual struggle or the Lord is still working on me. A lot of straight black people will take that and just be like, all right, come on in here with your simple ass. We'll, we'll, we'll bring you along the way. I mean, look at it. You can be gay as long, in, the, in the black church as long as your choir is the fighting temptations. Oh. Or, you know, you can oh. be gay and be in a, um, in a, uh, in a Greek letter organization so long as your black and gold comes with baggy jeans. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a thing of uh, some people are okay with putting a piece of themselves on a shelf if it means communal togetherness. I'm not one of those people. I don't mind being by myself. I don't mind being flooded by queerness and only queerness. But I do understand that, you know, no one wants to be rejected by their family. Nobody, it takes a, you know, it takes a very strong person to be like, I'll stand out here on my own. And everybody isn't like that. And I don't want to judge anyone for their decision. But I do think that you do have to think about more than just yourself when it comes to this issue. 
because if they feel like one of us is like that, they feel like all of us subscribe to that narrative. Anyway, so what I have to flag for you, black people, as soon as what black I want to do flag it, everybody. really quick, Kendall, is that I think that what you did is what I've seen a lot of gay men do, which is divert and protect. I didn't ask you to protect the omen. What I asked you to do was to explain to me why you feel like a mm. lot of the people in the community choose to specifically and why there's this influx or this supply and demand yeah. for these hyper-masculine DL men, right? Because oh. we have hyper, we have hyper-masculine gay men yeah. who are just as toxic as any straight boy you can find out there in the street, right? Mm. But there, <laughs> but there is there's a there's a, a need and there is a supply and demand order oh, for him okay. to identify as straight and for him for it to be this very like conjugal visit, three a.m. sort of exchange. Oh, it's just, and, it's just fantasy. It's, it's hot. It is what it is. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. I've had when I talk, I had a lot of fathers just like, "Hey, Mr. Edwards, my son needs some tutoring." I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> it's a flattering thing it's, it's very toxic but it's just one of those things where it's just like a lot of us want you know we like masculinity and it really doesn't have anything to do with mm. the straightness of it all it really just has to do with the fact that we are heteronormative people a lot of us, especially the ones of us who who receive love in a as a bottom you know that's what we want like we want someone who Amen. presents themselves like that I mean, you know, me personally, I don't want to date a man who wears nails and hair and all that stuff because I feel like, oh, that's, you know, I mean, even though that's not what how I present myself, I definitely don't want you to be behind me with nails and, oh, girl, and slap my ass. So it's really more of a thing of wanting masculinity in any form that you can get it. It has nothing to do with it being a straight or a gay man. I think that for some, that it is a challenge, but that's a, a, a whole other story and a whole other breed of toxic gay. But I think that really is just the promise of masculinity. It's the promise well, of having something that we I have like already to... decided as a people is the acceptable way to see black male or black masculinity. That but I want sense. to jump in and say that also, it's really a lot, I, for me, I feel like um, it has a lot to do with shame and it yes. has a lot to do with this, this um, 